and welcome everybody to the first lecture in the autumn term and hopefully we'll keep it going we could get lots of uh, people to give talks um, we should I should say well, so, sorry <laughs> I was meant to happen <laughs> um, Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I just wanted to put a picture of Vaughn up. Uh, do you mind, Dale? Not at all. Uh, if I can find it, that's the problem. Um, uh, I have to. Sh I have to share. Okay. <coughs> um, so. Ah. No. Oh, the technology is wonderful. Um, I'm supposed to be sharing. Yeah, we see your screen. Oh, you can see my screen, can you? Okay. I guess it's your screen. Yeah. So let's have a look. Uh, okay, so there's Very a picture of Vaughn. And, um, you know, it's a sad announcement which you probably all know about that uh, Vaughan Jones has died oh another great mathematician has died on our watch okay um let's go back to how old was he Roger you know? I think it was 63 is it? Uh, 69 Oh, 69 69 is older than I thought. Still a, bag, yeah. still a baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did he die of? Uh, he had uh, complications of an ear infection, apparently. Oh. My son-in-law's got he's got one of those, and it's gone got problems with his brain. <clears throat> okay, so um <laughs> Let's uh, oh, I see Andy's arrived. Hello, Andy. Hey, Roger. Um, and I've said hello to Uwe and Robert and hi, hi, Roger. Robert. Yeah. Um, hi, oh, and Brian. Hi, Dale. Uh, hello. Okay. So perhaps I should be able to. Mute everybody, I suppose. Um, I don't know how to do that. Um, anyway, perhaps you will refrain from talking, <laughs> except Dale, of course. So, yeah, don't mute, mute me. No. <laughs> okay, so we're very pleased indeed to have Dale Rawlson today who's going to talk about a theorem of Sayre concerning the uh, diffeomorphism surfaces. Okay, Dale, do you want to take over? Okay, let's see, I'll try and share my screen here, see how this works. Can people see this? Yes, I can. I can see it. <clears throat> okay, I've got, I can only see part of my screen because you, your faces are over part of it, but I guess I'll be able to read it. 
you can shrink that down if you want. Minimize it, Rod, uh, uh, Dale. How do you do it? The left left hand button at the top, right at the end. Oh, thank you. Now I can't see anyone. And you don't need to. <laughs> Get right. Can you see me or not? If I want to, but I have to. Oh yeah, okay. Anyway, I'm going to talk about mapping class groups and the theorem of Sarah. <clears throat> and I'm dedicating this talk to memory of Vaughn, uh, who's a dear friend and a great mathematician. So this is sort of a survey talk about mapping class groups of surfaces. And I'm going to focus on certain properties of the groups, uh, torsion elements and orderability and some conjectures on that. And at the end, I'll, I'll give the outline of a proof by uh, Sarah that mapping class groups of closed surfaces, although they contain torsion, they're virtually torsion free. Virtually in group theory means that a uh, finite index subgroup has the property. So I'm going to talk about first orderings of groups and then mapping class groups, orderability results, and then Sarah's theorem. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Benson and Benson Farb and Dan Margulies' beautiful book called Primer and Mapping Class Groups, which is the source of a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about today. I actually taught a course using that book uh, just two years ago, and it was uh, quite wonderful. Okay, so <clears throat> a left ordering on a group is a strict total ordering of the elements, which is invariant in their multiplication on the left. Uh, a lot of group theorists talk about right ordered groups. It's exactly the same family. If you have a left ordering, you can define a right ordering just by comparing inverses or other ways. And of course, we call G left orderable if such a ordering exists. And if that ordering is also right invariant, we'll call it a by order. And um, this is classically what was meant by ordered groups. It was not until sometime in the 60s, I guess, that people started concentrating on ordering invariant only on the right or the left. But it's an important and big class of groups. <clears throat> left ordered groups are torsion free because if you have an element bigger than the identity, then it's you multiply on the left by itself, you get f is less than f squared, so f squared is bigger than the identity, etc. Inductively, you get all powers bigger than the identity, so we will never have f to the n equal to one. And the same argument goes if f is less than one. But there are lots of torsion-free groups which are not left orderable. I won't go into examples. But, uh, another way of looking at ordered groups is look at the positive cone. If you've got an ordering, look at all the positive elements, the elements bigger than the identity. <coughs> and the product of two things in P is again in P, it's easy to see. And every group element is either in P or its inverse is in P or else it's the identity element. And then a converse, if you have a, if you have a subset satisfying one and two, you can define a left ordering by looking at, you say G is less than H if G inverse H belongs to P. And it's, quite easy exercise to show that that's a transitive relation. And uh, left invariant is automatic. If you multiply on the left by F, uh, you get F inverse F canceling in here. So that's the same criterion. A group is left orderable if an, by orderable, if it has a subset P satisfying this, and also it's normal. When you conjugate P, you're again in P. Um, 
left order ability and being torsion free are preserved, obviously, under taking subgroups. Same thing for by order ability. And extensions, meaning if you have an exact sequence, short exact sequence, and the two guys on the outside are left orderable, then the guy in the middle is again left orderable. You call an element here positive. If its image here is positive, or if it's trivial, then it belongs to K and call it positive there if it's positive in K. Um, this doesn't work for by orders quite. You have to have uh, <clears throat> a little more information to have it pass on. For example, the Klein bottle group, if G is a Klein bottle group, there's a there's an exact sequence where both of these guys are infinite cyclic. And this is left orderable, but it's not by orderable. Uh, there are lots of orderable groups in topology. I got interested in orderable groups from Patrick Dernois' discovery that braid groups are left orderable. Um, sadly, it's another great mathematician who passed away recently. Uh, surfaces, fundamental groups are all biorderable, including the uh, non orientable surfaces, with two exceptions. One is the Klein bottle, which is only left orderable, oops, typo, and projective plane, who, whose fundamental group is of order two, so it can't be ordered because it has torsion. Three manifolds, many of them are left orderable. If it's irreducible and you have a positive first Betty number, then the group is left orderable. And a special case of that, not groups themselves are all left orderable. So left orderable groups come up a lot in uh, low dimensional topology. Why do we care if a group is left orderable? Well, one lovely theorem is if you have a left orderable group, then its group ring has no zero divisors. Um, if a group has torsion, then you can cook up zero divisors in the group ring. I'll leave you to think about that. And it's <clears throat> an open question whether this theorem is true for torsion free groups. It's uh, Embarrassing that that hasn't been solved yet. Um, a biorderable group has even stronger properties. For example, if, if two elements have powers that commute, then they must commute themselves. Um, also, if two elements have the same nth power, then they have to be equal. In other words, roots are unique. Uh, that's also a strong property for groups. Oops. Abelian groups, for abelian groups, being biorderable is equivalent to torsion free. Dale? Uh, one way to see that is that orderability is a, a local property. A, a group has that property if and only if all its finitely generated subgroups are orderable or biorderable. And uh, if you take a torsion free abelian group, take a finitely generated subgroup, that'll be z to the n for some n, and you can order that lexicographically or, in fact, in uh, infinitely many ways. Free groups, non abelian free groups, are also biorderable. That's uh, not, not so obvious. Uh, one way to prove that is to look at the lower central series defined by the nth term is, is uh, generated by commutators with the previous term with F. And the lower central quotients are torsion free abelian. So we can by order them. And whoops, free groups are residually no potent, meaning that the intersection of the Fn from zero to infinity is just the identity. So 
to define an ordering, you take an element, call it positive. You look at the last n where it survives and look at its class in that quotient and call it positive if its class in that quotient is positive. And that turns out, uh, it's not too hard to see that that's uh, two-sided invariant ordering of the free group. Uh, for countable groups, being left orderable is equivalent to being a subgroup of homeo plus of R. This big group, homeo plus of R, is left orderable. One way to do that is to take uh, a sequence of dense elements of R, for example, the rationals, order them in any way you like, and then compare two functions by looking at the first element of that sequence where they differ okay. and order them according to their value on so that. Sorry? Somebody have a question? No. Another notion of orderability is circular ordering. There are lots of ways of defining a circular ordering on a group. One is a, a function that takes triples in the group into the set zero plus one minus one. And uh, that function can be considered a, a co-cycle. There's a certain co-cycle condition that you put on that. But for countable groups, it's actually equivalent to being isomorphic with a subgroup of homeo plus of the circle. So that's similar to this theorem for left orderability. This should really be called circularly left orderable, but uh, too many words there. So left orderable groups are circularly orderable because you can, if they act on the line, you just um, add infinity to R and turn it into a circle and then any action on that turns into an action on the circle, which happens to fix the point at infinity. Um, but <clears throat> circularly orderable does not imply left orderable. For example, a finite cyclic group is circularly orderable, but it's not left orderable because it's, all its elements are torsion elements. And in fact, if you have a finite circularly ordered group, it has to be cyclic. That's not too hard to see. So just a reminder, biorderable implies left orderable implies circularly orderable. And a very interesting connection between these concepts is a, is a recent theorem of uh, Adam Clay and Tyrone Goswala that a group is left orderable if and only if its product with Q mod Z is circularly orderable, if and only if its product with uh, cyclic groups is circularly orderable. <clears throat> Did I get that right, Adam? <laughs> yeah, that's right. But there's a third name, Jason Bell. A what? A third name to go with the theorem is also Jason Bell is on that paper. Oh, Jason Bell, sorry. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Okay. I'm not going to use the theorem, but I thought I'd state it because it's, I think, quite cool. Okay, so now let's look at mapping class groups. So this symbol S, B, sub G, N is the notation for the orientable surface of genus G with B boundary components and N marked points, sometimes called punctures. And they're in the interior if there's a boundary. And if, if either a B and N is zero, we just leave them out. In the notation. The mapping class group is the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the surface modulo isotopy. But uh, there's conditions on the isotopy. If the boundary is non empty, the isotopies are assumed to be the identity on the boundary and the homeomorphisms as well. <coughs> And if there are marked points, the homeomorphisms has to take the 
preserve the marked points setwise, it can permute them. And isotopies are assumed to preserve them pointwise. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some examples, the two sphere has trivial mapping class group, any orientation preserving iso homeomorphism of the sphere can be isotoped to the identity. Same thing for the disk, Whoop. which is genus zero, one boundary component. The annulus, you can always define a Dane twist that's fixed on the boundary that takes the interior twirling around. And uh, the Dane twist generates its mapping class group, which is infinite cyclic. Pair of pants, which is a sphere minus three open disks, has mapping class group three copies of Z uh, generated by the Dane twists around each of the boundaries. If you have some marked points on a sphere, if there's one marked point, its mapping class group is trivial. With two marked points, it's uh, order two. Uh, generated by a homeomorphism that exchanges the two. For three, it's a symmetric group on three elements. With four marked points, it gets a little more difficult. I won't, a little more complicated. I won't elaborate on that. If you look at the disk with N marked points or punctures, that's another way of looking at the N strand braid group. So that's a familiar group to all of us, the one that I talked about a few, a few months ago. Now, Darren Wamp proved this remarkable theorem that the braid group is left orderable, highly non trivial. I think this, together with the fact that they're linear, is the, are the two most important uh, results about the braid groups in the last. A uh, couple decades. <coughs> it's not biorderable, at least, well, for n equal to two, it is, that's just the integers, but for n bigger than two, for example, you use the braid relation to show that sigma one two cubed is the same as sigma two one cubed, right? So these two guys have the same third power, but they're not equal. In fact, they, they give rise to different permutations. So re recall that biorderable groups have unique roots. The braid group does not have unique roots, so it can't be biorderable. But we'll see it's virtually biorderable because the pure, pure braid group is biorderable. A uh, couple of ways of seeing that uh, you can give a, a proof very much like the one for the free group because these are torsion free null potent, uh, residually null potent, and you, you give a similar argument. Or you can use art and combing and show that this is some iterated free product of free groups or uh, semi direct product of free groups, sorry. So the braid group, which is this mapping class group, is virtually biorderable because we have a biorderable group, which is finite index, n factorial in the braid group. Now we'll see that many mapping class groups aren't, aren't left orderable because they contain torsion, but we'll, we'll see at the end that according to Sayer, they're virtually torsion free. So you might ask, is every mapping class group virtually left or biorderable? This is, uh, in a way, this talk is work in progress for me to try to understand this question. Let's look at another example, torus minus an open disc. This has an interesting mapping class group SL2Z tilde, this so-called universal central extension 
of SL2Z. Well, this group is left orderable, and let's see why. <clears throat> I'll give three different arguments. This has a presentation of two generators that says XYX equals YXY. Well, that's really isomorphic with the braid group. You take X and Y as sigma one, sigma two, and that's left orderable, but not by orderable. <clears throat> This group is also the fundamental group of the complement of a trefoil. It's a group of the trefoil knot, which is left orderable, like all knot groups. And a third way to see it is you can consider SL2Z as a subgroup of SL2R, which is a, a three dimensional space with the homotopy type of a circle. Is universal cover SL2R tilde uh, acts on the real line. Uh, if, if you look at PSL2R, so you mod out plus or minus one, that acts on the circle by fractional linear transformations. We're going to take the circle to be the, the uh, real line together with infinity. And that action lifts so that SL2R tilde acts on R. So we have that this group, SL2Z tilde, is a subgroup of SL2R tilde, which is a subgroup of homeo plus R, which is left orderable. Okay, so giving three proofs isn't always that more uh, enlightening, but I thought I'd throw that in. Uh, so mod S11, is left orderable and is virtually biorderable because again, it's a braid group. Now, around the turn of the century, Dan Kramer and um, Bigelow showed that braid groups are linear. That is, they're isomorphic with a subgroup of uh, complex matrices, square matrices with non-zero determinants, G, L, K, C. The analogous question for most other mapping class groups is, is still open. Is mod SG linear? Let's forget about boundary components for the min moment. Uh, this question is open except for G012. And uh, it's an important open question in the theory of mapping class groups. I have no idea of the answer. But they do seem to have a lot of properties of linear groups. For example, they're residually finite. Okay, anyway. Now let's look at the mapping class group of the torus. This turns out to be isomorphic to SL2Z, the group of two by two matrices with determinant one, integer entries. And the way to see that is you look at the action of the mapping class group on homology. The first homology of S1 is Z plus Z. And you take a mapping class and send it to its induced map on homology. And if you choose an appropriate basis for Z2, you can, this defines a homomorphism from mod S to SL2Z, and it turns out uh, that this is an isomorphism. For higher genus surfaces, you have a similar map, but it's not an isomorphism in that case, but in this case it is. Now let's look at this group, SL2Z. It's, um, I think, interesting to look at some detail on this. First of all, it's got a lot of torsion. It, this matrix, has order two, the square and it's the identity. This one has order three, this one has order four, this one has order six. Um, so those correspond to homeomorphisms of the torus, again, with, which have that order. Uh, it's a little hard to visualize, but there they are. It's easier to look at the algebra. <clears throat> 
In fact, this group can be generated by torsion elements. For example, these two guys generate SL2Z. So there's enough torsion in there to actually generate the group. On the other hand, it's virtually torsion free. It has a finite index subgroup, which is torsion free and in fact biorderable. Here it is. You take th these two matrices. I, they belong to SL2Z, and I claim that they generate a free subgroup of SL2Z. Uh, you can see that by a ping pong argument. I won't go through it. It's quite a famous uh, folk theorem, I guess. I think it was known to Felix Klein, even. And it has index 12. And as a corollary, mod. S1 is virtually biorderable because it has an index 12 free subgroup, which is biorderable. Now I want to kind of warm up. We're going to be talking about congruent subgroups. So let's first look at the field Z mod 2Z with the uh, 0 and 1 as its elements and the uh, multiplication is sort of the standard for mod two. And the group of matrices with these entries that have determinant one, it's finite because there's only finitely many matrices with, with those elements. And you can easily enumerate them. You get the identity. This is the other matrix with only two ones. Here's one with the th three have three ones. If they're all four ones. <laughs> then it doesn't have determinant one, and if there's only one one, same story. So these six elements are <coughs> the whole group, SL2, Z mod 2, Z. <coughs> now, there's also homomorphism from SL2, Z to that group I've just been talking about. And the kernel is called the level two congruence subgroup. And we denote that by putting a little two out here. This two is different from that two. Uh, it's, it's the two that comes from here, not from there. So this congruent subgroup is being the kernel of such a map is obviously a normal subgroup here and its index is just the order of this group, which is six. Turns out it's generated by these three matrices, these two guys, which we've already discussed, and then minus the identity. So the free subgroup that we mentioned above is an index two subgroup of this congruence subgroup because it doesn't contain this, but it contains those two. So it's an index two subgroup of an index six subgroup. So it has total index 12. Ah, now let's look at higher genus surfaces. Then we have hyperbolic geometry to help us. The universal cover of SG is the hyperbolic plane, and we can think of SG as this, as the set of orbits of free action on H2 by isometries. And here's a, a picture of this, thanks to Adam Clay, who was kind enough to let me use his picture. Um, we can use this to define some orderings on mapping class groups. For example, if we take one marked point, then mod SG1 is circularly orderable. Uh, for G equal zero and one, that's not too hard to see. So let's look at the hyper hyperbolic case. So. Let's see, I want to go backwards here. So if you take a homeomorphism of the surface fixed on the point P, take a particular lift P tilde of P, and I claim that this homeomorphism will lift to a unique homeomorphism of the hyperbolic plane. 
which <clears throat> fixes this particular P tilde. Well, a homeomorphism of the hyperbolic plane will extend to the boundary, which does not actually belong to it, but is uh, a limit. It, it's a boundary in some sense, and that's a circle. So this, any homeomorphism lifts to a unique homeomorphism of H2 fixed on P tilde. That extends to the ideal boundary, which is a circle, and then we get a non-trivial action of mod SG1 on the circle. Non-trivial here means that any non-identity element goes to a non-trivial uh, homeomorphism of the circle. So that gives a circular ordering for all these mapping class groups if we have a, a single puncture. Uh, higher genus surfaces, if, if we don't have marked points, well, they also have a lot of torsion mapping classes. Uh, for example, the genus five surface has an obvious order five element in this mapping class group. And it's non-trivial, it acts non-trivially on homology, for example. It also has an order four element. If we had instead a hole here and only four arms, you'd get a similar uh, mapping class with no fixed points and uh, of order four. Uh, sometimes it's hard to see the torsion elements. For example, uh, the genus two surface has an element of order five in this mapping class group, but it's not obvious from looking at the usual picture of S2. Um, one very important element of order two in the mapping class group is the so-called hyperelliptic involution. If you string the surface along uh, a skewer like this, which pokes through the, the holes, and then take the, the pi rotation around that skewer that rotates this thing to itself, and it, uh, it has fixed points here, 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 here. And there's 2G plus two fixed points. And the action of the hyper elliptic involution on homology is minus the identity. That's not too hard to check. So there's lots of torsion in these uh, mapping class groups. But if you have a non empty boundary, then there's no torsion in the mapping class groups. So, <clears throat> in fact, there's a beautiful theorem of uh, Hamish Short and Bert Beast. Again, are you, well, are you using uh, hyperbolic geometry? The genus is at least two and there's non trivial boundary, then the mapping class group is left orderable. Well, their argument in a nutshell is similar to um, the previous one, but you can arrange that the action fixes a particular point in a circle because you've got the, this restriction that it's fixed on the boundary. So uh, this mapping class group actually embeds not only in homeo plus of S, but homeo plus of R, because it fixes every point on the circular boundary. Uh, I'm lying a little bit. You have to remove some elements of the uh, H2, but it, it still has a boundary, which is a circle. Now let's go back to closed surfaces. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, this, this mapping psi from the mapping class group to SL2GZ. 2G is the order of the, of the uh, first homology. And this map just comes from uh, taking a, a mapping here and look at its, at its effect on H1. And that gives you a 2G by 2G matrix. 
In fact, the image of this is not the whole group of matrices, but the so-called symplectic matrices. That's because the intersection form on uh, the surface is respected by any homeomorphism. So this is a technical condition for something to be an SL2G. It, it has to uh, have this equation where J is, is the uh, symplectic matrix, which is uh, the block diagonal sum of these guys. The kernel of psi is called the Torelli group. It's a normal subgroup and it has infinite index if G is bigger than one. If G equals one, it's just the identity. And now again, we can define level M congruent subgroups uh, as before, but we look at the kernel of the mod M reduction map that takes a matrix of integer coefficients to a matrix with coefficients of the integers mod M. Whoops, bad font there. It's a normal subgroup of finite index, and it obviously contains the Torelli group because that's the, the kernel of all these, in the kernel of all these guys. Now, a basic observation is that these, well, if M equals two, we saw before that minus the identity belongs to, belongs to the level two congruence subgroup that's actually a torsion element, right? Because the square is the identity, but it's not the identity. Examples like that don't happen in the higher congruent subgroups. Whoops. Uh, the theorem is that for M at least three, SLNZ and uh, symplectic 2GZ, the nth level congruent subgroups are all torsion free. Uh, the proof is not too hard. I'll just give you a, a taste of how it goes. By contradiction, assume you have a matrix in here, which is not the identity, but it has finite order K. Um, we can assume that both M and K are prime. You see, if, if, if M divides N, then this contains SP2GZN. So anyway, so we can write A as the identity plus some matrix where all the entries are divisible by M. That's what it means to be in, in the congruent subgroup. But if A is not the identity, then you can you factor out all the factors of little m in here and you still have something left which has an entry not divisible by M. And then use the bio, binomial theorem, you get A to the K, which, which we're assuming is trivial, but it's one plus this plus K choose two times M to the D squared, T squared, and so on. And argue that the stuff in the dots vanishes modulo some power of M. And therefore, this guy cannot be the identity because we still have this element T there. So that, that's the argument. Well, mapping class groups, we can also define a congruent subgroup. You look at the, this mapping psi into SP2GZ and then look at reduction mod M, and then take the composite here. This is a finite group, so this turns out to be a finite index normal subgroup. And Sayre's theorem says that for genus at least two and M at least three, the finite index normal subgroup mod SG M of mod SG is torsion free. 
In other words, uh, these mapping class groups are virtually torsion free. And here, these are a lot of finite index, index subgroups that witness that. Okay, so the proof of that, it'll follow from a theorem that's on the next page, which states that if you have a torsion element of mod SG, <clears throat> and its image under psi is not the identity matrix. So if it were a torsion element, its, its image would also be a torsion element, but this has no torsion. Okay, so you get a contradiction. Okay, so let's look at that theorem. If G is at least two, and you have a finite order element of mapping class group, then I claim that psi of F is not the identity in here. Psi of F, remember, is just the induced mapping on the first homology of the surface. Well, to prove this, we need a, a deep theorem of, I guess it's called the Nielsen realization theorem. And if you have an uh, element of finite order, you can actually get a, a uh, representative which whose kth power is not only isotopic to the identity, but actually is the identity. So we can realize actually any well, the theorem of Kirchhoff is that uh, any finite subgroup of this can lift to a set of homeomorphisms. So we have choose a representative whose kth power is the identity and on the surface. And now we can assume that that's an isometry by just averaging the Riemannian metrics at any point, average the metrics over all its images under F, take the pullbacks, so that you can assume F is an isometry. That's a standard trick. <coughs> now, if there are any fixed points, there may not be fixed points, but if it does have a fixed point, then the derivative at x is a two by two matrix of determinant plus one because it's orientable, orientation preserving. Uh, so actually, and it's non-trivial because if it were trivial, then the map itself would be a trivial map. It's just determined by what it does at a point in a neighborhood. So dfx is a non-trivial rotation, which means that x is an isolated fixed point of F of index one. Now there's this famous theorem of Leschetz that says if you have isolated fixed points, the sum of their indices is equal to the so-called Leschetz number, the alternating sum of the traces of F on the homology. <clears throat> well, we know that the index the sum of the indices is non-negative, so we have L of F is greater than or equal to zero. And on the other hand, it's one minus the trace of the middle dimension, H1, plus one. The two outer ones are plus one. So if psi of F were trivial, that would mean that this matrix would be a diagonal matrix of ones, and this trace is at least four because I've got 2g here and g is at least 2. So that if, if this is at least 4, we get a contradiction that 1 minus 4 plus 1 is positive. Okay. So that's that's the proof of Sarah's theorem. And let me now just summarize. We have in general mapping class groups of closed surfaces contain in fact, I didn't argue this, but in general, they're all generated by torsion elements. But on the other hand, they have finite index subgroups which are torsion free, namely the congruent subgroups for all M at least three. 
Now, the congruent subgroups have an interesting history, too, which I'll just say a few words about. <coughs> It's known that there are finite index subgroups of the mapping class group which do not contain the Torelli subgroup. And therefore, they can't contain any congruence subgroup because all those guys do contain the Torelli subgroup. In other words, these mapping class groups do not have the so-called congruence subgroup property, which uh, I'll show in a minute in another context. Uh, also, for G equal one, SL2Z also fails to have the congruent subgroup property. There are, there are uh, finite index subgroups of this that do not contain any congruent subgroup. But then I want to remind people of this amazing theorem of Bass, Milner, and Sayre that for n bigger than two, matrix groups S, L, N, Z, and S, P, 2, G, Z, for G at least two, do have the congruent subgroup property. That is, every finite index subgroup contains some congruent subgroup. Uh, that has consequences in, for example, looking at the, uh, uh, the uh, completion of the group. What's it called? Uh, uh, sorry? Malsev? Malsev, yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's another word for it, though. That, anyway, the, uh, it'll come to me. <laughs> okay, so let me just conclude by recalling some open problems. Are the mapping class groups linear? Are they virtually orderable in some sense? Virtually left orderable, maybe virtually bi orderable, even. Thanks for your attention. That's all I want to say. Mm. Well, ah, thank you very much, Dale. Thank you for listening. <laughs> well, that's a, a great start to term. Uh, are there any questions? It appears not. I, I, I had some questions. Oh, Scott has a question. Okay. To review the um, elements of order two, three, four, and six. I didn't. I didn't note down the one of order six. I wanted to play with those. Oh, okay. Let's let's see. Can you see my screen? Not yet. <coughs> oh, I guess I have to share my. Oh shoot. Will you send us your slideshow? Yeah, I can do that. Great. Excellent. Okay. Well, that'll that'll suffice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, if there are no other uh, questions, um, I'll thank Dale again. Nice talk. And um, thank you. Well, we meet again in a week's time. Um, if nobody else wants to talk, I'll give a talk, a uh, fairly chatty talk on. <laughs> um, <laughs> on uh, notation, mathematical notation, and how it affects knots and physics, um, as we know from the work of uh, Vaughan, that um, there's close connection between knot theory and physics. And he was happy in both uh, endeavors. So, um, and then after that, maybe Lou might give a talk explaining what I've said. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, should I send you the uh, the slides from my talk? Yes, you send me the slides or send them to Lou. Lou, is, them got, to Lou. Is, is the sort of library bank. Right, and Lou, you'll put it on your Dropbox? 
Yeah. Right. Okay. Send it to me and it'll end up in the Dropbox. Okay. <laughs> Not the circular file. <laughs> I guess I did have a question, um, which I think I know the answer to. So you wrote at six matrices in FL2, Z2. Uh, that looks to me like it's just um, non abelian group of order six, right? So which one? FL2, Z2. Yes. It's a so, non abelian group of order six. It's not cyclic either. Right. So it's, it's, the dihedral group, right? I guess that's right. Yeah. Okay. Every element has order two or three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, if there are no more questions, I'll stop recording now and uh, hope to see you all. Same time next week. Okay, I I guess in our part of the world it'll be a different time. It'll be an hour earlier. Can you cope with that? Uh, yeah, you'd have to get out of bed a little bit earlier. <laughs> well, at least you don't have to talk. You can just sit there That's and right. pretend That's to right. listen. <laughs> <laughs>